I'm really excited uh, to talk to you all along with uh, Dr. Collarwood because uh, Maine has recently um, become a collaborator on the NUA platform. And uh, if you're familiar with NUA, um, it's been in use throughout the Northeast for a while. Uh, it's primarily driven by apple and grape production, but we have a lot of really interesting tools uh, that have the potential to be uh, an important part of your IPM toolbox, so to speak. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but just to kind of get your feet wet, uh, I'm going to assume that folks aren't as familiar. So NUA is short for NOR, um, Network for Environment and Weather Application. I almost made the exact mistake I was about to point out. It used to be Northeast Weather Association. So there's a lot of former acronyms, uh, but you can call it NUA or NIWA. It's really regional, to be honest, but everybody understands uh, what you're saying. Uh, again, I'm a senior extension associate with uh, the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. I'm project lead for this platform, uh, but it's really done in a collaboration with a lot of folks, which you'll see, um, which is the only way it's possible. So I just want to point out Dr. Art DeGatano, who's the director of Northeast Regional Climate Center, along with his staff, provides some really critical support for making this happen. Uh, I'm putting a QR code up here and uh, actually forwarded a PDF of this presentation uh, to Peyton in case anybody's interested, but you can scan this with your phone to go right to the new uh, uh, website to start playing around with it. I really encourage people to just dive right in. I'm not at all offended if you folks are trying to play with it as I'm talking, because that's really how you become more comfortable with this. So um we really try to make this accessible for growers and, you know, those folks who are who really might benefit the most. Uh, so we try to integrate all sorts of approaches, uh, including this type of thing. So I'll uh, just leave it up here for one more second. You'll see a couple other QR codes as I go through my slides. Feel free to scan them. Um, but again, this is uh, maybe it'll be available offline at some point. So uh, I want to point out uh, NUA is actually a project within New York State Integrated Pest Management, which is part of Cornell Collaborative Extension. So we're part of the land grant system here in New York State. Um, again, we've got a QR code to this webpage if you're interested in exploring uh, some of our other resources. But I really point this out um, because I think for a long time, people assumed NUA was this great big independent program. It's really not. Um, it's very uh, organic, so to speak, uh, and it's very from the ground up. Um, I work on it full time with uh, a part time person who does our help desk. Um, and that's really it. We get some subsidized support uh, from other states who see what we're doing and they're like, maybe this might be useful for our growers. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, because, you know, with all of this conversation we're having about climate change and adaptation, one of the things that is really useful and has proven to be useful in the past 20 years or so uh, in New York and elsewhere uh, that NUA has been implemented is this idea of taking uh, a five-day weather forecast, hourly forecast, and converting it into something that has a biological context. So again, I mentioned apple production. So we've got a whole suite of insect uh, development prediction tools, degree day models. We've also got diseases, um, but we also do this for grape production. Um, we also have some horticultural production tools. So apple thinning, uh, whether you're looking at the fruitlets or you're looking at the blossoms, we've got tools that integrate all this live hourly weather data coming from a very large network at this point of either um, curated mesonet type uh, weather data or private, privately owned uh, farmer data. So we have a couple of vendors you can work with. And if you want to purchase a station for maybe $1,500, $2,000, you can get these really um, local predictions um, and even microclimate. Like we talk a lot about microclimate now. So just a few different things to keep in mind. I already mentioned uh, NUA is, a, is, is part of New York City Integrated Pest Management and we're part of this land grant system. Uh, but I want to I bring up this map because I think part of what makes NUA work is like this, this public access, like it's an open platform. And 
you know, not everything fits in every region, but there are certain core tools that really are have a universal appeal um, to growers and producers and extension folks and specialists and all, all sorts of stuff like that. So part of really what's driven newest growth, uh, and I'm not going to show it here because we're talking about Maine, but like we actually have a, a pretty large geographical footprint across the eastern U.S. and even out as far as Utah at this point. Um Again, driven by apple production. So irrigation, crop thinning, pest management. Part of the part of uh, what makes Nua work is a whole side that you don't see. Like it's it's invisible to to you all as users, but we have an entire backend that uh, supports our data, uh, historical records are curated. Um, data are quality controlled from every one of the probably close to 1,000 weather stations we have connected to this platform. Uh, and our partners at Northeast Regional Climate Center curate that data for us. And I just have a circle around where they're located down in Ithaca, New York. Um, and again, you know, they've they've been a critical part of this entire process. But I'm providing this context because it's not just, you know, it's not just a website. You you really should be thinking of this as a decision support system, and it's a very extensive and uh, nuanced system that makes this work for everybody. Uh, just a quick listing. I'm not going to literally read these all off, but this is uh, what we currently have available. There's insect models. There's disease models. We have apple scab. We have a fire blight model, which is really really useful. Um, uh, it's one of those models that integrates hourly weather data. And uh, if you work with apples, you know, like if, if fire blight is detected, you've got to take action quickly or you have a very high risk of, you know, losing your entire orchard. Um, so, again, just to, to point out how how relevant and useful and timely uh, these types of tools can be. Um, let's see here. So NUA in Maine is actually very, very new. Like, I'm really excited about this. Uh, you know, NUA isn't meant to, like, be the answer to everything. And, in fact, NUA, Maine has some really good and useful tools. And I, I think Gun Kohler is going to talk about Ag Radar at the next meeting, which Peyton just man mentioned. But, really, the idea is um, we're supportive of, okay, if NUA is, like, one little extra thing uh, that might be useful to you or your growers or you know whatever part of the agricultural sector you're working in let's make it available and so lily calderwood and sean burkle uh have worked really hard the past year or two uh to to bring the new platform uh to maine and really what that has involved is um is you know identifying what those basic resources are and the way it works is that um main at the state level just pays a very like a very modest stipend uh, i think it's 1500 or 1750 a year um but that is that basically means um you know some of these costs for operations are subsidized because like i said i'm part of the new york state land grant system and we just kind of want to make sure we have a little bit of support but what we're able to do is at this point anybody in maine who wants to buy a weather station that's compatible uh, can do so. And like, that's the only cost that's incurred. So once you do that, once it's linked to the new platform, you have full access to any of those models uh, that I, I listed earlier. Um, and that I think Lily is going to talk about in just a little while here, uh, but just to point out uh, a few more things uh, on this particular collaboration um, is that, it complements the existing extension education efforts in Maine. We're not, it, it's not us taking over anything. And you'll see the platform in a minute. It's actually very flexible. And what we do with our state partners is we're always presenting it in context. So if you add your weather station, um, it's going to show up as part of the University of Maine network. It doesn't show up as Cornell. It's, Cornell's not splashed all over everything. Um, it's it really, we did a lot of work to acknowledge the partners who make this possible. Uh, I already mentioned it should only be one tool in your IPM toolbox. You know, our extension colleagues, the IPM specialists and other people out there in, 
in uh, the fields are the ones who, sh you know, if you've got questions, you you really, sh if, if NUA gives you a heads up that something's about to happen, you always want to be verifying that. Like, you know, oh, NUA says to do something or oh, a grader says to do something. Just, you know, based on your experience, you got to be making those decisions. Uh, I already mentioned the newest subscription costs is covered. Um, so at the grower level, there's no additional financial burden. Uh, and the only cost is the purchase of that weather station if you're interested. I've got a, a slide coming up that I'll just describe what those are. Um, and in my opinion, it really does pay for itself. It's not like you're buying a $1,500 machine and it's just sitting out there not doing anything. We did a, a survey in 2017 and actually we're probably due for another five-year survey where we polled or we um, we asked all of our current NUA users uh, a series of standard questions. And one of them was, how much do you avoid in crop losses on an annual basis using the newer platform? And the average value came back as $30,000. So that is not an insignificant amount. Uh, the cost of one of our vendor weather stations is anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500. If you capitalize those costs across three to five years, which is usually what we think of as the typical lifespan, lifespan, you know, the benefits you're getting from a system like this uh, far outweigh that upfront costs. I just threw a couple of pictures up here um, of the type of, of machines we have out there. So on the left-hand side, this is an onset machine. Uh, and then the one in the middle is a Kestrel Met machine. So these are the two private vendors that we collaborate with. So if you're interested in getting your own machine, you would reach out to one of these two vendors. Um, you kind of have to make your own decision. I don't generally recommend one over the other. I think if you're in research, um, Onset might have some advantages, uh, but there's different price points and different capabilities. And that's something you kind of work out on your own. Um, but again, $1,500 to $2,500 range. But the other um, data source that really is quite significant at this point, I'd say it's like 30 to 40% of all locations are these highly maintained statewide mesonets. So a good example is in New York State. We just uh, signed a collaboration with New York State Mesonet. That's what you're looking at here. But this is typical of some of the state level mesonet systems. So Delaware has this type of setup. Michigan, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, there's these three types, and then you're also going to see little uh, airport icons. So we do pull in um, as a baseline, and that's probably the case right now in Maine, um, you know, National Weather Service locations, uh, or actually it might be ICAO. I don't remember what the acronym is. But again, curated hourly data that are available that can inform our models just a quick note so like we have all these data points coming in from you know at this point close to a thousand weather stations it's all curated through this platform called ACES the Northeast Regional Climate Center provides this as a service to all the other regional climate centers nationally um, and this is where all the quality control comes in they've got APIs that we call when somebody's interested in looking historically so you know, if I'm in Geneva, New York, where I'm based, uh, and I want to look back at 2015, I can do that and still run the models on that. It's a really flexible platform. And I think at this point, um, I don't want to talk at you too much longer. Uh, I'm going to transition into, like, the first little demo piece. And I'm really going to focus on high-level operational things. Uh, like, that's really my focus. I'm not the expert on all of these tools that you see on the NUA platform. That's where our regional liaisons, our new estate coordinators or our extension specialists or our uh, researchers really are the ones going out and doing um, the workshops and the trainings on exactly how to use this, but I'm going to show you how to get around basically in a couple of really neat tools. So the first thing I'm going to point out is that NUA is a website that behaves like an app. Like these terms are always thrown around, but there's a big difference. So if you actually download an app to your phone, that's like a standalone piece of software. And the problem, and we made a conscious decision a few years ago when we re redesigned this website we did not take that path because every time 
uh, iOS or Android is updated, you need to have a full team in place to make sure that your, your app that you've downloaded to your phone doesn't break. So the compromise is that you can go to nua.cornell.edu, and if you're on your desktop, it looks just like a website. But if you're on your mobile device, and this is really the direction a lot of uh, uh, we see people going in, like I'm out in the field, I just need quick access, it's going to look and behave like an app that you downloaded, even though it's not. So you do need to have internet connection. Um, but aside from that, like it's got a lot of really interesting features. So wanted to point that out. Um, and I've already shared the QR code, so I'm going to skip past that. And I'm going to stop sharing this, and I'm going to attempt to share my browser. And it might look small for a second. Hopefully, I can get this figured out here. Do this. And um, let's see, Peyton, can you just confirm that you can see that OK? Looks good to me. All right, great. So <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a quick navigational tour um, and show you one really interesting feature, and then I'm going to hand it off to Lily. So this is the landing page. This is what you see. This is more for somebody who knows zero about NUA. Like we just try to feature some interesting stuff. But what I, the first thing I want to do is show you, uh, if you click here on Crop and IPM Tools, this gives you a complete listing of everything we have. And I recently restructured this page for really easy navigation. You're going to see I've got um, these little hyperlinks. Uh, some people call them breadcrumbs or whatever, but this lets you get around really quickly. So say you're interested in grapes, you just click on that. It takes you immediately to the grapes section. If you want to go back to the top of the page, every section has this link. It takes you back to the, back to the top. Um, pretty easy. So if we're looking at berries, you'll see, and uh, I'm not going to, uh, ruin the surprise, or I don't know what Lily's doing, but uh, you'll see we've got blueberry maggot and strawberry diseases, and that gets you around. Um, if you want more information about getting a weather station, we've got uh, this link over here, and this just takes you uh, to this page where it lists our vendors and how to get in touch with them. Um, each of those vendors has their own landing page for their new collaboration, and they'll try to feature things that they think might be useful to you. Um, the last thing I'll show you in my portion here is we actually have this profile system. So if you're a person um, who is like regularly visiting some of our newer models um, or you have specific weather stations that are of interest to you, like I mentioned, we've got over a thousand, like close to a thousand weather stations. You don't want to be scrolling through those every time you want to use the platform. You can create a profile. So what you would do is go up here to sign, sign in and then what you see here, uh, I already have an account, and so that's why uh, you're seeing this stuff. But if you don't have an account, all you do, sign up, create a password. We're not asking for a lot of information. Um, what we do ask for is protected. We don't share it with anybody. Um, but what you do is you create your profile, and then you would log in. We'll let this load. And now this is like a completely different layout from that first landing page, page you saw. You'll see the URL is a little bit different. So it's newa.cornell.edu uh, backslash user. This is loading all of my personalized data. And so what you can do, uh, and I won't go through it in detail, is you basically just customize what you want to see. So uh, when you first sign up for the profile, you've got to adjust this little bit of information here, and that's all you need. But then you can select favorite stations. So you can already see that it's very easy to do this. If you know the specific name of a station, you can type it in. If it's your first time and you want to explore, we've got this map tool. So like I said, there's not a whole lot up in Maine yet, but like if I wanted to add the three stations that are in Maine, um, you just click on them. So there's one, there's two, and there's three. And that's all you have to do. Um, the only other step you would want after this is, you know, maybe you just want to see Blueberry Maggot. Um, so you would activate the tools you want, and then that's all that's going to show up on your dashboard. Let me just make sure there's nothing else selected here. And let's see what happens. So you go back to your dashboard. And so now those three stations that I've loaded into my personal profile, those are the only ones that I'm going to see. 
So I've got Augusta, Bangor, and Lucent. Um, if I want to change the location, it's pulling data in real time. It's showing you the five-day forecast. It's giving you an overview. And you'll see down here, here's the, the model that I just added. So all these other ones are, are models that I've activated. But if I go back and deselect those, I'm not going to see anything except Blueberry Maggot. So that's just a really uh, quick and dirty introduction to how the NUA platform works. And I think at this point, uh, I'm I'm pretty good on time. I don't want to take up any more. I'm going to turn it over to Lily, and then it sounds like at the end we've got time for questions. So with that, let me stop sharing my screen and take it from there. Thanks, Dan. That was great. And now I'll share my screen. I have a PowerPoint, and then um, we'll go back to the website. So yeah, here I'm just going to try to um, explain how NUA can be used in Maine and some of our uh, future endeavors into crop and pest tools in Maine. So uh, first, you know, as Dan mentioned, we have an IPM toolbox. And that toolbox means that you scout for insects, pests, and disease, and then you could use a management tool uh, such as are available on NUA, AgRadar, AgriNet. There are all these names of different uh, groups that have tools. Um, today we're talking about NUA tools, and these may help you to identify when a certain pest will emerge so that you know you're better informed on when to put traps out, for example. Or it, it would predict when your crop plant is going to reach a certain stage when it is therefore vulnerable to a certain pest. And then you would follow your economic threshold. That is a common IPM term to, to uh, determine when action needs to be taken. So if you reach that economic threshold, then you go and you evaluate your options. Those options being, depending on cost, they could be cultural, mechanical, or pesticide um, solutions to uh, control or manage that pest. So all of these, all of these aspects are, part of your IPM toolbox, and all of them will reduce the amount of pesticide used, reduce the amount of pesticide in the environment, but also save growers time and effort. Uh, these tools that we're talking about in particular save money and product released into the environment. So I just want to make sure that that point is super clear. Um, it really is. These tools are critical to the future. and. Uh, you know, Dan and Nua has has been around for quite a while, um, but the fact that we're not using these tools in Maine is unfathomable. <laughs> and so we really do need to use these. They are a part of precision agriculture that will help farms be more sustainable and efficient. So what are growing degree days? A lot of these models are based on growing degree days or they use these growing degree days in the model to predict when these different biological activities are gonna happen. So growing degree days, often abbreviated GDD, are it's a uh, plant development prediction uh, using heat units, so every day, a certain amount of heat is accumulated. And so a growing degree day is an accumulation of heat units. And every day, one is accumulated. And as the season goes on, you accumulate up to a certain number. And research papers show that for every particular pest or every particular crop, at this number of growing degree days, this is going to happen. So. I'm not going to do a lot of math with you, but, and there are a few different ways to calculate growing degree days, but just so you know, the calculation, the most simple one is the max temperature for the day plus the minimum temperature for the day divided by two 
minus your base temperature. I will explain what a base temperature is. But for example, say in the spring, we had a 60 degree day. That was the high for the day. Then the low temperature was 40 degrees. You end up with an average temperature for the day of 50 degrees. So then you subtract, 50, you subtract 40 from 50. 40 is your base temperature. And that's an established number that's um, developed through a lot of research. So you know you've got this base temperature. And so you end up with, on this day, you accumulated 10 growing degree days. So these growing degree days are uh, used to predict when plants and pests will develop. Some uh, crop and pest tools are more complex and they'll use additional um, factors such as soil moisture or leaf moisture, or relative humidity of the air um, and uh, biofix dates, which I, I'll explain a little bit. So if you're curious to learn more about growing degree days, you can go to the newest site. They have so many resources on their site and uh, you know, kudos to Dan to have having this um, so easily accessible and easy to read. Um, they've got a whole page on growing degree days. So to give you a sense of growing degree days and how we use them in wild blueberry production, this is the 2023 season and we go out and we collect data on when blueberry plants developed each different stage. So we go out, go out every week and across 10 different sites. And all of these sites have a small weather station at them. They, they don't happen to be connected to new weather. They're too um, cheap to do that. Uh, but so here you can see <clears throat> each line on this graph is representing a, um, the growing degree days for each region in Maine. And so the dotted line kind of falling behind the others. We have three lines here that are clustered together. That's the Midcoast region, Ellsworth region, and far down east. So those, those all developed at uh, the growing degree days accumulated from March 1st through the season, really all together. Uh, the down east region is a little further inland, so it's a little cooler, and it developed a little bit slower. So we we by you know June 7th here, we had accumulated fewer growing degree days in the down east region than we had in the rest of our wild blueberry growing regions. And so we we can use these growing degree days over time. This is these are growing degree days across our wild blueberry crop year. So as the plant develops, how many growing degree days does it take? for the plant to develop to each different stage. So we've been uh, collecting this data for three years now. You can see there starts to be a trend of um, an average number of growing degree days that are required for the plant to reach each stage. <clears throat> and this can also be done for insects and disease and all other plants. So, Two important details that I've talked about here. One are daily base temperatures. So daily base temperatures are typically 40 or 50 degrees, and that's the temperature at which the organism can grow or develop further. So you need to have that piece of information, uh, which, is our, which is included in all these newer tools. It's already there. Um, and you also need a starting date or a biofix date. And so that means these are dates at which you begin accumulating your growing degree days. So for example, in wild blueberry production, our starting date is March 1st, because that's when wild blueberry starts to develop. Um, and we typically use a 40 degree Fahrenheit daily base temperature. Biofix dates are another way to do it. And I'm not as familiar with biofix dates, but is the same concept, I believe. So for example, from the newest site, they have um, their apple, apple scab model that will begin at 50% Macintosh green tip. 
So as those buds are at green tip, that's when um, development would occur that makes them vulnerable to us to apple scab. Uh, for fire blight, their biofix is first blossom open. So that's when the plant is vulnerable to fire blight. And so that's when you got to start um, accumulating these growing degree days. Or the model will start. All right. So now I have an example, which is the blueberry maggot fly tool, which we use in wild blueberry. And on the newest site, this is exactly what it says. There's a little description under each tool. For this one, it says optimize monitoring for blueberry maggot fly or blueberry maggot with this base 50 degree Fahrenheit degree day tool that predicts adult emergence and enhances your ability to use IPM, not replace IPM to determine if insecticide treatments are needed. And so this tool predicts the date at which you would set your traps out in the field. It does not tell you what day to spray. It doesn't tell you, um, you know, when to do your management. It tells you this is the day that this, the mag, the uh, pupa are likely to be emerging from the soil. And so you gotta get your traps out to see if you have a pest problem. And so traps are used to determine if you reach that um, threshold. And now let's look at the blueberry maggot life cycle. So the over the winter and into April, you have uh, the pupae are in the soil and they emerge. They come out of the soil as adults in June. And so we're trying to predict that date. And so this model predicts when the adults emerge from the soil, because at that point they could go and lay eggs in the fruit. And so that at that point they're ready to, um, you could have a problem. And so now it's time to put those traps out to see uh, where exactly and how many flies you've got. If you reach that threshold, then you would do your management. Okay, so now I want to go to the website and share my screen, the website. Okay, so here, as Dan was mentioning, you've got all these different tools that you can use. And we don't only have berries, we've got a lot for field crops, apples, and vegetables, I think, are the ones that would be most used in Maine. Um, for blueberry maggot fly, since we just talked about it, here we are. And you would just click on this. And right now, I have my weather station set as Bangor, Maine. Right now, it's, we're not during this season, so you got to go back. If you were during the season, you wouldn't have to go to the calendar. But let's go back to June. And uh, we're not quite there yet. So I'm looking, um, here we go. So under this page, you've got your management guide. It tells you some more details about how this works. And then down here is the results table. And so you're looking for the degree of risk that you're willing to take. And when the risk is low, it's likely that no blueberry maggot flies have emerged from the soil yet. When it's moderate, it's like, yep, it's time to put out your traps. And when it's high, uh, you know, it may be too late. There probably definitely are flies out there. And so as we move through time here, you can see, you know, you've accumulated 904 degree days, you're, you've um, definitely reached the point 
where you should put your traps out. So the flies have, have certainly emerged at this time, July 10th. Let's get those traps out. And so that's blueberry maggot fly. I wanted to mention down at the bottom of each of these tools. So there's a graph. You can see how this, um, how the growing degree days change as the season progresses, increase. And then at the bottom, you can click acknowledgements. And here, they will list where exactly this model came from. Sometimes there's a published paper publication here. Other times it's the name of the person in the university, which can be really helpful. Okay, now I just wanted to go back, not make you too dizzy, back to NUA Home Crop and IPM Tools. And I just wanted to give you an example in the vegetable category of, let's say, onion diseases <clears throat> and how this one uses a biofix date, which is planting date. So for this tool, you would click planting date. You would select your planting date. Let's say it was in April. And then it will provide you with all of this in information, excuse me. <clears throat> and I don't work with onions and I also don't work with diseases. So I don't know everything that's here, but it's really doing the same thing. It's telling you how many, the number of favorable days you've had. And this would allow you to predict um, when to start managing for these different diseases of onion. So these are complex, but very understandable at the same time. And once you understand that it, it is primarily temperature that produces these results for diseases, it's also likely humidity or leaf wetness that's also being used. But again, you can go down to the acknowledgements and learn more about the model by contacting these people or looking up their publication. Okay, and I, Dan, I think we wanted to show people that you can also just do a general growing degree day calculation. Here we go. So if you go back to weather tools and just scroll down, and let's say you just wanted to know how many growing degree days have accumulated in my location, you can click on this degree day calculator and get those for your, for your start and end date. You have to put in a start date and an end date. Um, so that can be really use, <clears throat> useful as well. And I'm gonna stop sharing, go back to my PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry for the back and forth. Now I wanted to, oops. I wanted to talk a little bit about using crop and pest tools in Maine and how this has evolved. So looking at the site there, you can see that only three stations are connected to New in Maine, but there are many more weather stations than that here. <clears throat> and uh, those are the airports, as Dan mentioned, that are connected uh, because he did that. <laughs> and so that we are lacking, I, I think it's a combination of um, a lack of education uh, we haven't been able to do yet to get these tools into the hands of growers. Sorry, I have to <clears throat>
Okay, sorry about that. So um, <clears throat> we did a needs assessment around weather tools in 2019 and 2020. And this included 300, uh, 134 farmer participants from mixed vegetable, apple, and wild blueberry. And so we had a lot of participants and we did um, find that 34% of farmers currently use these tools. <clears throat> they could be from NUA, they could be from other sources. Whereas 86% of farmers expressed interest in using these tools. So a lot of people would like to use these tools, but they're not necessarily uh, ha available to them. So that's why we connected with Dan and brought on NUA into Maine so that it is available. But the lack of weather stations is a, is a real problem. So, in 2023, uh, Sean Burkle, myself, Beecham, and Phil Fanning here at UMaine, we put in a congressionally delegated spending request to uh, the federal government through UMaine to create a Maine mesonet. So those are stations, fancy, really good stations, that would be connected to NUA and be used for all sorts of other weather applications. And so that was a three and a half million dollar proposal. It hasn't been funded yet, but it has been approved by the Appropriations Committee um, at the federal level. And next it will go to the Senate for consideration. So our senators in Maine have approved it and they would love to fund it, um, but we have to wait for a federal budget to include it. It would probably go under NOAA. Um, each of these CDS or congressionally delegated spending requests have to be identified, the funding source has to be identified. And so for our, this case, it would be NOAA. <clears throat> so this would bring on 26 stations that are 30 feet tall, expensive $30,000 each um, stations to meet. And it would really, really help to um, boost the amount of data coming in <clears throat> to inform these tools. So there would be at least one per county and more than one per county in areas of high agricultural production. <clears throat> And they would be fenced in. And Sean Burkle <coughs> it would really be the hero here. Um, <laughs> I, I am leading this grant, but Sean would be managing a few different people who would um, make sure that this comes to fruition and is managed really well. So as the climate, um, Specialist, like the climatologist in Maine, he really is the person to do this. And so he would hire a mesonet manager, a data scientist, and a field technician to manage all these stations and manage the data coming in. And so our path to sustainability, um, first I want to say that there was overwhelming farmer and mesonet um, support. Um, farmer support from those in Maine and uh, mesonet support from other mesonets. So we are connecting with mesonets from other parts of the country. Um, and so to make sure that this is really well done, we can learn from their mistakes to make sure it works in Maine. Um, so our path to fund this, the CDS would sustain it for five years. And then after that, we think there would need to be a membership fee probably from these um, grower associations in Maine that we do already have support from. And the other way that you can make money is by selling weather data. And so we would sell the weather data to the National Mesonet Program, which would help um, fund part of it. And so would the Mesonet data feed into NUA? Yes. 
we're not at all trying to reinvent the wheel. These the tools are already there. Newer has got all these amazing tools. Um, I think just more education needs to be done by all of you um, and us in extension to make sure people know that they're available and how to use them. Um, and more tools would certainly need to be developed. For example, in Wild Blueberry, we can't use the high bush mummy berry tool um, if it becomes available because our low bush blueberries are so low to the ground. So um, the humidity is different on the ground versus, you know, a few feet up. So that's just an example. Um, at least the wild blueberry industry is interested in creating more tools. And um, so of course there are always more tools coming along. And I saw on the newest site that there are a few tools coming online in 2025. So you can tell, and I'm sure Dan could talk more about this, you know, there are always more tools coming on. So the other the last point I wanted to make is that, so Dan mentioned the onset and Kestrel Met stations. Those can be purchased by farmers and connected to NUA with no charge. And that's very easy to do on the website. Um, if some, in addition to this mesonet that we're trying to get, there's no harm in also having more onset and kestrel net stations. And so the more of them, the better. Um, the farmer does have to maintain that station. And, but farms in Maine would certainly benefit from having more of these stations because it can fine tune the weather to their actual microclimate and their farm. And therefore they can use tools for their specific location. Um, and when you go on to the newest site, you know, you select that town or that group of stations and the more you select or, you know, the more precise you could be with your location, the better. So that's really all I had. I wanted to <clears throat> thank everybody for, or thank Peyton and Ellen for organizing the webinar and also our senators for considering this new proposal, which would be a game changer for Maine. Um, and to Dan for doing this with us. It's really good to um, collaborate with Dan and you. Okay, that's all I had. Um, and I think Dan wanted to mention some other applications of the wonderful data you collect, like uh, crop insurance. Yeah, and I don't have I don't have slides, but really I think I just wanted to share one uh, really use uh, one good use case that happened. Uh, I don't know how far up it went, but if anybody remembers in the news last year, uh, May eighteenth, twenty twenty three, there was a regional freeze event, um, and this happened during a really critical period of development, especially for grape production. Um, if uh, you know anything about grapes, you know, they have a certain level of cold hardiness, but as spring starts to come on, they lose that ability to resist and, you know, not be damaged uh, by freeze events. Well, so May 18th, we had a really freak incident and uh, across the entire region, uh, there were significant um, events. And so what we were able to do uh, really within 24 to 48 hours was take all of our data, all of our hourly data from the NUA platform, because we're, you know, we're curating it on behalf of everybody, came up with a map that showed how many hours were below freezing during this event and what was that minimum temperature. And we've gotten many, many reports that that was super useful uh, for crop insurance purposes. So, you know, we're talking about some very formal tools right now on the NUA platform, but there's a lot of potential. And uh, honestly, Layla, I've been talking more about the potential of what NOAA can do versus, well, what here's what we have, take it or leave it. And Lily, you already mentioned that there's some different tools that will be more precisely useful for blueberry production in particular. And like, we're at a point where we can we can scale up or scale down as there's demand. I, you know, there's a lot of uh, coding and programming that goes on behind the scenes. 
I think we're also at this point developing a good understanding of like how to quickly turn things around if there's a new need or like a risk um, or an event that happens. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you start to think about NUA moving forward.